Good morning, friends. Welcome again to Sabbath School Study Hour here at the Granite Bay Seventh-day Adventist Church in Sacramento, California. Very warm welcome to our online members and our friends who are joining us across the country and literally around the world on the various television networks. We're just delighted that you have joined us for our special Bible study time here at our church. Very warm welcome to the members and the visitors that are here as well, ready to study together. Over the past few weeks, we have been studying through a lesson theme entitled Oneness in Christ. We're nearing the end of our lesson courtly. Today we're on lesson number 12, which is entitled Church Organization and Unity. Very important subject that we'll be looking at today. Uh, but before we get to our lesson, we'd like our friends to know about a free offer that we have. Uh, it is a book entitled, The Church, Is It Babylon? People have questions about that today. We'll be happy to send this to you. All you need to do is call us on our resource phone line. That number is 866-788-3966. And you can ask for offer number 712. For those of you outside of North America that would also like to receive a copy of this book, you can download it for free. All you'll need to do is text the code SH116 to the number 40544. And of course, by the way, if you're in North America, you're also welcome to text that code and you can download a copy of the book, The Church is at Babylon. We'll be happy to make that available for free to anyone who contacts us. Well, before we get to our study, we always like to begin by lifting our voices in song. I'd like to invite our song leaders to come join me. We're going to begin our worship singing uh, before Sabbath school with some Christmas songs because it is that wonderful time of year. And we're going to sing this morning number 119, Angels from the Realms of Glory. We'll sing all four verses so you can follow along at home in your Adventist Church hymnal. Angels from the realms of glory Thank you so much for singing. Dear Father in heaven, once again, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather together and study your word. We are also grateful for the rain that's falling and just pray that the Holy Spirit would fall upon our hearts and minds, guide us into a clear understanding of this very important subject, talking about church unity. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Our lesson this morning is gonna be brought to us by Pastor Doug. Happy Sabbath. We've got a good lesson today talking about uh, church organization and unity. And we're continuing in our study on oneness in Christ. But before we get to that, I got an exciting announcement. We're doing lesson 12 today. And who knows what comes after lesson 12? Lesson 13. And then we're going into a new quarter 
uh, with the new year. Now here at Granite Bay, because we record the lesson in advance for our satellite friends that uh, broadcast the study, uh, we're going to get into it in December. But you know what the lesson is? It's on Revelation. So we're really going to be excited about that. And Pastor Ross and I are probably going to descend into some wrestling matches to see who gets to teach certain chapters. I know this is his favorite, uh, his favorite study is Revelation. So just wanted you to know about that. We'll probably have our local ones that'll be out here at the table next week for uh, those that attend here. But today talking about oneness in Christ, we're in lesson number 12 and we're talking about church organization and unity. A very practical subject and important. Have a memory verse. Memory verse is from Matthew 20, verse 26 and 27. I'll always appreciate if you want to say that with me. Matthew 20, verse 26 and 27. If you do it right here out of the quarterly, it's uh, in the New King James Version. You ready? Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. The theme, the attitude of servant leadership in the Christian church is uh, the principle that uh, operated in the life of Jesus and one that is followed in the life of his believers. We believe in servant leadership. Now, when we talk about church organization and unity, we've got some sections in here, like the first section talks about Christ, the head of the church. And because Jesus is the head of the church, it doesn't mean that there's no organization in the church and we're all to sort of, uh, you know, go around like ants, you know, the, Proverbs says ants have no master or, or overseer, but they all seem to know how to work together. And it'd be wonderful if we said, let's just all be spirit-filled and we won't need any structure in our church. We'll all know like little ants somehow supernaturally know what their little job is and where they're supposed to carry their food and guard the trail or whatever it is they do. You know, bees have a queen, but we don't know that the queen is issuing uh, email directives about what all the bees are supposed to do, but they seem to know. Isn't it amazing? Uh, and, and some suggest that if we just have a church that's spirit-led, we can all work like bees and ants. And we, everyone's just going to show up and the Spirit's going to tell us what to do. Well, that's a little idealistic. I don't think that's what the Bible is saying. Uh, we are all supposed to be servants. And we all have our role. We use our various spiritual gifts. But God does have structure and organization. Now, you notice that it says here in the introduction that we really don't follow a, a hierarchical, that's where you get the word, a hierarchy, a form of governance. Uh, you know, if you were to point to the um, Catholic Church. Catholic Church, in some respects, uh, it is amazing because they've got you know, like 1.2 billion members in the Catholic Church, and they've got five levels of administration. There are a lot of companies that marvel when they look at the Catholic Church and think, how do they operate this international organization with only five levels of structure? And, uh, but they do it quite effectively. Um, there are varying levels of structure in God's church, and we're going to talk about some of that. But the first thing we want to establish is who is large and in charge in the church of Jesus Christ? Who is the leader? And that under the first section under Sunday, it talks about Christ, the head of the church. You already knew the answer to that, right? So um, someone's going to look up for me in just a moment Ephesians 1.22, and I'm going to read Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body. Church is called the body of Christ. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So in how many things does he have the preeminence? In all things. Christ is the head of the church. Well, I thought that would be God the Father is the head of the church. Well, the Bible says Jesus is. Now, why can it say that? I want, I want you to look with me. Well, I'll tell you what, before I, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, well, let me give you one more verse, then we're going to go to the Ephesian verse. Philippians 2, verse 10 and 11 that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. 
So is there any question, who is the head of the church? Is it a pastor? Is it a pope? Is it a bishop? The head of the church is Jesus. He has not surrendered the headship of the church to any individual. Um, all right, please read for us your verse. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body in fullness of him who fills all in all. You know, when you pay 100% of the cost of something, you take title of it and you become the owner. And so what right does Jesus have to be declared the head of the church all in all? He bought it. <laughs> you want to just put it in the simplest terms? He paid for it. How much did he pay? Did he pay 50% down? Or did he pay 100%? So how much does he own? He owns 100%. He is the head of the church. Now, I want to give you something else to think about, another principle that, by virtue of this principle, makes him the head of the church. If you go in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, I think everybody knows this, John chapter 1, verse 1, you know, uh, you look in Mark and you look in um, Matthew, they, they introduce uh, the birth of Jesus. John goes right to the birth of everything he doesn't go to the birth of Jesus. He goes to the birth of everything when he starts his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, now it's telling us the Word is a he. Who is the he? Who is the Word? Jesus. You'll notice your Bibles probably all say capital W-O-R-D because it's a title. It's not a word. <laughs> the Word is not just a word. It's talking about a name. That's one of his names. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It says, uh, the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And here's the point I want to especially emphasize. Verse 3, all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. By the way, some people wonder if Jesus is eternal God. I believe he is eternal God because of this verse. Because if Christ at some point was made way back in the infinite recesses of history, some argue, you know, who don't accept the Trinity. They say, well, you know, Christ, he, he came into being. He was somehow made. They don't like to use the word made. He was begotten. It's the same thing. If you were not and then you are, uh, you've been made by the Father. But if all things were made by Christ, he didn't make himself. So one reason he's the head is because he redeemed it. Another reason he's the head is because he created it. And so uh, it's like that story we, we tell sometimes to the kids about the little boy that made a little sailboat. He used to sail in a pond, and um, he loved it. But one day a breeze came along, and it carried it away, and he couldn't get it, and uh, he had to leave. Well, a few days later, he saw that his little sailboat was in the local pawn shop in the window. And then he went in, and he said, that's my boat. And he said, well, someone brought it in, sold it to us. It's mine now. And so the boy worked so he could get enough money to buy his boat back. And after he bought his boat back on the way home, he said, you're mine for two reasons. He said, I made you, and I bought you back. <laughs> and so we belong to Jesus by virtue of creation and redemption. And so he is the head. He has earned the right to be the head. Um, another verse here, Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 7, you've made him a little lower than the angels. Now, I want to pause right here. Who knows? You made him a little lower than the angels. Is that a New Testament verse or an Old Testament verse? Paul in the New Testament is, in Hebrews, quoting from the Psalms in the Old Testament that's talking about man being made a little lower than the angels. Humans are made a little lower order in power and strength than the angels. The ministering spirits. We're better than the angels in that we're made in the image of God, but angels have more power than humans do physically, and they may have some abilities we don't have. Angels can't procreate like we can. We're made in the image of God in a special sense. But now in Hebrews, when Jesus is quoting David's psalm, you made him a little lower than the angels, is he talking about humanity or is he talking about Jesus? This is a verse about Jesus. 
he's um, saying that he became a man, made a little lower than the angels. So the one who made the angels made himself not only equal with man, but lower than the angels that he made. The angels are the ministering spirits of God, and yet Christ made himself lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, he's still quoting the psalm, and set him over the works of your hands. You put all things in subjection under his feet. For that, he put all things under him. He left nothing that is not put under him, but now we do not yet see all things yet put under him. In other words, the world is still in rebellion, but the day is coming when every knee will bow, everything will be in subjection to Christ. Jesus is the head of the church. 1 Corinthians eleven thirteen. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So even in heaven, does it seem that they recognize an order? Uh, now, are God the Father, Son, and Spirit equal in power? Are they eternal? Are they all-knowing? But do they seem to recognize that there is uh, a difference in authority somehow. Um, Christ always looks to the Father as the final authority. Why does the Bible say God so loved the world he gave his son? God, that would be the Father, correct? So loved the world he gave. So does he have the prerogative to give? When it says the, the Father has committed all judgment to the Son, well in order for the Father to commit all judgment to the Son, the Father must have some kind of authority to do that. You still with me? And so, and you always see, never do you have the Father and the Son saying, worship the Spirit. Do you know that? There's some denominations that make a big deal about worshiping the Spirit, but please show me in the Bible where we are to worship God the Spirit. We got songs about it. I said, show me in the Bible. Silence. Because <laughs> the Father and the Son are always talking about, well, if the son's always saying worship the father, the father says worship the son, but you never hear where the father and the son say worship the spirit because the spirit's purpose is to direct worship to the father and the son. That's his office, not to, to draw it to himself. So now we're delving into things that are way over our head. But um, let's get into the next section where it talks about servant leadership. Now this is where you see things are a little different. Um, the concept of servant leadership did not begin with Jesus. The concept of servant leadership is where you've got a general in an army and the general says, we need to dig foxholes here along the front line and the soldiers salute and they get their shovels but the general picks up a shovel too and he starts to dig. Those soldiers will work the hardest for that general because he identifies with them. Doesn't mean he stops being the leader, but he is also a servant leader. Now I remember I had a friend, still, still is a friend, that um, a talented musician, he, before he was a Christian, he played with groups like Chicago. Some of you know who that is. I mean, he was a tremendous guitarist, and, and uh, I was doing an evangelistic meeting with him one time, and after the meeting, People were breaking down and taking up the speakers and the wires because we had to vacate the premises. And uh, I'm visiting with the interest, and my friend was helping break down. He came over, he said, Doug, you're gold bricking it. And gold bricking is sort of a term that's used in the concert music industry where the, the performer was acting like a useless gold brick, and all the other people did the work. And so he used to always tease me, if I was not helping break down with everybody else after the evangelistic program, he said, you're being a gold brick. Now, God's servants are not to be gold bricks. Um, now, does a pastor have some authority in a church? Or an elder, or a deacon? I mean, we're not the deacons invested with a degree of authority. You remember there was a dispute that certain widows felt like the Jewish widows were getting more than the Gentile widows and, and you know, Peter and the apostles were getting caught into these disputes and had, having to mitigate the problems and finally they said, look, it's not appropriate that we leave the word of God, by the way, this is Acts chapter six, and serve tables. So they said, let's choose out among you seven men that we respect for their judgment, their dedication to point them over this business. And so they prayed, they laid hands on them. Now what was meant by that? 
They invested them with some leadership authority. Does that make sense? So once Peter, James, and John and the apostles went off to do their preaching and their praying, and there was some contest or some problem to be resolved about the distribution of the offerings to the various widows, did the deacons have authority? Yes. They did. But what does the word deacon mean? It's Greek for servant. They were servants. They were leaders, but they were servant leaders. And, you know, the deacons actually, two of them, well, there's three of the deacons that appear later. You know what their names are? They're, they're all named when they're ordained in Acts chapter 6. But three of them, their names pop up later. You know, Barnabas wasn't a deacon. He was a good man. He, he became a, almost an apostle, but he wasn't a deacon. So you got Stephen. Do you remember that name? First martyr? Stephen ends up becoming a preacher, and he gets killed for his preaching. Philip, Philip is not only called a deacon, but later he's called a what? An evangelist. Come on, you guys read your Bibles. This is stuff you should. An evangelist, right? And the Bible says Philip had four daughters that did prophesy. That means they taught also. And so Philip, he starts out as a deacon, but later you see him preach. Philip's the one who baptizes the Ethiopian treasure. So did they have some authority? They were given that, right? Did Jesus invest the apostles with authority above the regular disciples? Did he? He did. And that was recognized. And so saying that Christ is the head of the church does not mean that it is a church without structure or organization. So that, that's the, um, the point we're wanting to make here. Let's talk a little more about servant leadership. Matthew 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, why were they asking that question? Why did they want to know who was the greatest? Did they want to know if Jesus was greater than the Father or was Jesus greater than angels? Or were they asking about among them? They're wondering where they're going to be. Now, keep in mind, um, they're picturing something on the biblical model of King David. You know, David started out and through killing Goliath. He worked his way up. Pretty soon he's king. The mighty men around David who started out as just this ragtag group, the ones who came to David. Have you ever read that? It says everybody in debt and everybody discontent. They followed him. and He becomes like this Robin Hood and he turns this group of misfits into mighty men. They're later called David's mighty men and they end up holding positions of leadership in his kingdom. They become his captains and his generals and his counselors and his scribes, his mighty men. So the apostles are thinking, hey, I wonder what role I'll have in the new kingdom. And, uh, you know, Peter's thinking, I want to be general. I, I can use a sword. And, and uh, you know, John's thinking, I want to be the chief scribe, the secretary for the nation. And Judas said, I want to be treasurer, right? And so they're, they're all wondering what their position is going to be in this kingdom. And they're thinking on, you know, a king's cabinet. So that's what they're asking. Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? Jesus knew what they were thinking. He called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, ah, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So the emphasis here, now you and I have all known some children are not 100% humble. Uh, but Jesus is, you know, talking about children that back then were taught to, you know, be seen and not heard and be re respectful and humble. And, and uh, so he's addressing a problem. What's the opposite of humility? Pride. What causes problems in relationships. Pride. I've done a little bit of marriage counseling and in almost every case, you know what causes the arguments? Pride. Someone's got to have the last word. Someone's got to be right. Someone can't say they're sorry. And pride's at the foundation of that. But it's not just in marriages. It's in organizations. Someone doesn't get the promotion they think they should have. Someone doesn't get elected to the office they think they should retain 
and their feelings, their pride is hurt, and you have all kinds of discontent and problems. And so Jesus is saying, no, in my kingdom, whoever is going to be the greatest, he needs to be like a little child. Another similar verse, Matthew 20. Jesus called them to himself and said, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. They, they order each other around, and they flaunt their authority, and they abuse their authority. Yet it will not be so among you. But whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. Now you notice he's not saying nobody is great. He's saying whoever is great, he must be a servant. See, in the world we always think God's best gifts are on the highest shelves. But in God's economy, the best gifts are on the lowest shelves. You don't get them by reaching higher, you get them by kneeling. Uh, in the world, we think you measure success by how many people serve you. But in God's kingdom, you measure success by how many do you serve. And so it's just a whole different way of thinking. But it doesn't mean there is no authority or organization or leadership. There is. But the leaders must be servants. I, I work with a pastor I will not name in, in a church that I will not name. And the people love this pastor because... I, he was an associate I worked with. Um, whatever was happening, he was not a gold brick. After potluck, he was in the kitchen doing dishes with everybody. Before the potluck, he was setting up. Uh, when there was a work bee, he was out there working on the grounds. When there was no work bee, he was out there working on the grounds. Uh, he would be the one who would stay behind and fold the bulletins. Uh, he was somebody who just... He, you could always see him very happy being a servant, and yet he had authority as a pastor. And people respected him because uh, he proved his authority as a Christian leader by his willingness to serve. And so this is the principle that Jesus is giving us here, and we've got some more scriptures on that we're going to share. Um, matter of fact, in a moment, someone's going to read 1 Peter 5, You'll have that one, okay. Uh, I'm going to read, um, and then the final part of this in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. You notice that Jesus didn't travel around with attendants that were carrying him on a leader and uh, shining his shoes and, um, you know, a lot of... You, I've been places to preach. I've got to be careful what I say here. I've been places to preach before where the church leaders were assigning me bodyguards. Kind of made me nervous. I said, I don't want any bodyguards. And uh, I had fun sometimes. They'd give them to me anyway. I tried to run away from them. <laughs> and they're trying to chase me around. They were so afraid for my safety. Because they're so used to other evangelists from their divisions coming in and they, they want to be served. Like they're, you know, what can we do this or this? It's like they got their own little entourage of servants that run around and do whatever they ask. And I thought, I don't think Jesus operated that way. Um, Philippians 2, verse 7. But he made himself, Jesus, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Now, who was the greatest of Jacob's sons? Joseph, good. Who of Jacob's sons understood best what it was to be a servant? Joseph. Uh, did Joseph become a slave? Did Joseph serve in a prison? He learned, he, he served there on a farm. He served in Potiphar's house. He served his father. He was out doing an errand for his father when he was betrayed by his brothers. Joseph spent years, rigorous years, finding out what it meant to be a slave. And because he learned how to serve in the lowest positions, he was qualified to serve in the highest position. He went in one day from being a slave in a prison. Think about what slaves in prisons do. 
I don't think too long about it because I'm sure it's not pleasant. And he went from that to having 50 men run before him with a chariot, probably golden chariot. Uh, so, um, but God prepared him for that position because he understood what it meant to serve. You know, the reason that the soldiers of Alexander the Great were willing to follow him into battle is because he would get right down in with the troops and help them haul firewood and help them build the fire and he'd charge off into battle. He would be in the front of, he'd go point in a battle. Jo uh, Alexander the Great, one historian says, would try to be the first one over the wall to conquer a city and that's the one that, and he did get wounded once or twice. But his soldiers were so afraid that they'd lose him they would not let him get ahead of them and they would charge ahead because he was willing to serve with them. And so, like I said, the concept of servant leadership is not uh, totally new. All right, please read for us your verse. First Peter, chapter five, verses two to three. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Amen. There's something that Peter is saying here that is very important about church organization. In, in a lot of worldly organizations, you've got different levels and there's different pay scales according to those levels and different benefit packages according to those levels. And with the more authority, there's more pay and ostensibly more benefits. But Peter said that should have nothing to do with your service for Christ. It is still a wonderful thing to me, I've never fully gotten over, that I got involved in ministry before I was hired as a pastor and they weren't paying me anything. And I was happy as I could be. Don't tell them that because they might want to change their mind. But I was happy as I could be doing it for nothing because I enjoyed it so much. To be able to teach and preach and now get paid to do it, I just, it's like I pinch myself. Am I really actually getting paid to do what I was doing for nothing? It's wonderful. I think it was Will Rogers who said, figure out what you want to do and find a way to get paid to do it. Um, so, but in the church, something I've noticed is um, the more that it becomes a profession and people get paid, they start doing it as a career and not from the heart. We can't lose the spirit of volunteerism and service in the church. If everybody's got to get paid for everything, you end up with higher lanes. What I mean by that is they're not doing it because they love the sheep. They're hired shepherds. They're doing it for a career. And if the wolf comes, they'll say, I'm going to find another job, not my sheep. But if they love the sheep, it's like David. He loved his father. He loved his father's sheep. And when the bear came, he put his life on the line to save the sheep. That's what Jesus said. The good shepherd, he'll lay down his life to save the sheep because he's not a hireling. In the church, you don't want people that are doing it for what Peter calls filthy lucre. <laughs> you don't want people to be doing it for gain. You want people to be doing it because their hearts are in it. It's a ministry. And I've noticed, you know, as soon as you start paying volunteers, um, the other volunteers start saying, well, that guy was a volunteer, now he's getting paid. I want to get paid. And pretty soon the whole spirit of sacrifice and service can be destroyed. Uh, people need to be doing it. The early churches... I mean, they, they all did it just because of love. There are a lot of places in the world where the church is entirely run by the members and there is no money that comes from outside. They do it because they love the message, they love the Lord, and you just got to be careful that we don't get where it's a career. Um, he says, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over the flock, but examples to the flock. Uh, Luke 9, verse 46, Then a dispute rose among them as which of them would be the greatest, and Jesus perceiving the thoughts of their heart. Now this is giving you a little more insight into what we read there in Matthew. Uh, evidently, and this is probably during the last week or so of um, Christ's ministry, they were on their way to Jerusalem. They figured Jesus, you know, maybe it was after the triumphal entry and he's getting ready to establish himself as a king and the disciples are thinking, any day now he's going to hand out a list and tell us what our cabinet positions are. And, you know, I want to be on his right hand and his left. And remember James and John. They went one place says James and John came to him. The other place says the, the mother, they sent their mother. 
and said, my sons, you know, how could he say no to mom? And they said, they want to sit on your right hand and your left hand in your kingdom. I mean, they started out following you before you picked all the other apostles. They were right there at the very beginning. And hopefully you're not going to forget that. You'll be loyal and give them a position on your right and left. That meant great authority. And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to be baptized with my baptism and drink the cup I must drink? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. They had no idea what he was talking about. They wanted the authority. They didn't want the baptism that comes with the authority. The baptism was a baptism of suffering. And I always thought it was interesting. Of those two apostles that came to Jesus saying, we want positions on your right hand and on your left hand. What were their names? James and John. Who was the first apostle to die beside Judas? Judas died at his own hand. James. You can read in Acts chapter 12, King Herod beheaded James. Who was the last of the apostles to die? John. Isn't that interesting? So uh, they did. They were bad. And John was a prisoner. They both suffered for the Lord. So um, it, sh it needs to be done from that, uh, that Christ-like spirit. So they're arguing, who is the greatest? And Jesus perceived their thoughts. He knew what they were arguing about. And he said, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me, him who sent me. For he who is least among you, he will be great. The one who is willing to serve. Again, Mark 9. He came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he said, What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent. They were ashamed. For on the road they disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down and he called the twelve and he said, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And then again he puts the child in them. So uh, servant leadership is not the same thing as no leadership. Some people say, well, in Christianity, you know, we just have servant leadership. It means no one's really the leader. Servant leadership means there are leaders, but they should lead by example, willing to serve. Now, um, we're talking about organization. We're talking about unity in and through the organization. There are a couple of extremes. One extreme is that a person has a very hierarchical church model where the pastor sees himself as the pope or dictator or the conference leaders. You know, the, the, it's very heavy-handed administration. Everyone's ordered around, and, and it's not through example and consensus and praying together that you, you come to your vision. Um, so that would be one extreme. The other extreme is there's really no leadership that we all just kind of pray and we, you know, say, all right, you know, what shall we do today? Uh, have you ever run into someone that says, you know, I, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in church organization. I don't believe in religious organization. Have you ever, I'm spiritual, but I don't support religious organization. People who say they do not support religious organization are really saying, I support disorganization. Because you only have two choices. If you say, I don't want to be part of any religious organization. You're saying, I want to be part of a disorganized religion. But is God disorganized? God is not the author of confusion. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, let all things be done decently and in order. There should be an order. There should be a function. But I tell you, things work a lot better when we're organized. Have you noticed that? If you've got people that have the gift of organization and administration and they can get everything organized, it's great when uh, a little later today, if you don't know, we're having a special Christmas program. Everyone's invited, 6 o'clock here. And those involved, it's quite an act of organization to have the choirs come up, sing the notes at the right time, the musicians change places. And, and you'll have a beautiful program, I'm trusting, because there's a lot of organization and planning that goes into it, right? It's true of God's work in His church, in our plans for outreach, in our plans for inreach, in discipleship, in uh, mentoring people. It's great to have a plan and be organized and then implement the plan. So being spiritual and believing in the headship of Christ does not mean that we don't believe in church organization. Uh, we, we can't get anywhere without that. Um, for example, Exodus chapter 18. 
Moses, believe it or not, when he first led the children out of Egypt, they were a nation of slaves. They had been ordered around by the Egyptians for hundreds of years. They had no internal organization. Now they've just escaped. They're in the wilderness, and it's a little bit of chaos. I'm so glad to hear that even they struggled with a little chaos. Moses' father-in-law comes along, and this is someone who's given Moses advice, so he's older than Moses. He watches what's going on, he sees everybody milling around. They don't even get into a line, you know, and they're all trying to get Moses' attention. They got all these different disputes that are happening in their various tribes and in their families, and their goat ran off with my sheep, and which is whatever is happening, you know. And, and it's, it's probably a lot of chaos. They got all the goats and herds and sheep and stuff. They're all commingling. They're fighting over water and resources. And so he's disputing these things, and he sits till, from morning till night trying to advise them on how to resolve all their conflict. And Jethro, very kindly, he takes his son-in-law aside. Now, son-in-law is 80 years old. He takes Moses aside. He says, son, let me give you a little advice. He says, you're going to wear yourself out. This is not how to run an organization. <laughs> he said, you need to delegate. He said, here's my advice. And you find this in Exodus 18. You shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, because you don't want them to be bribed. You want them to have good unbiased judgment, hating covetousness, and place them over the people to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens, have these different levels so they can spread out the concerns. Let them judge the people at all times, and it will be that every great matter, you're the Supreme Court, they'll come to you with the big matters. They'll bring to you every small matter. They themselves will judge. It'll be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you, he said, God will be with you. God will bless you. And you know what? God told Moses, listen to your father-in-law. That's good advice. And he did it. Now, they then had a special meeting. They prayed, and the Spirit of God came down on the 70 elders. Some of you remember that story in the Bible. God gave them his Holy Spirit combined with their natural gifts of administration, judgment, and leadership. But they became organized. They had to get organized because it was, it was a mess up to that point. So does God believe in organization? And it's through organization you often have unity. But the organization must be spirit and servant driven. Jesus said, if I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, should you wash one another's feet? Is there anything a leader in the church should say, well, I'm the pastor, I don't do that. Or should all of us be willing to do anything that needs to be done? See, we're all on a level playing field. Nobody is worth more or better than or more valuable to God than anybody else. Salvation is equal within the Christian church. It doesn't matter if you're male or female, slave or free, black or white, Greek or Jew or barbarian. The Bible tells us that we're all equal when it comes to the availability of salvation. And we should demonstrate that. Uh, there's a quote here in the lesson from the book Desire of Ages I thought was good, page 550. Christ was establishing a kingdom on different principles. He called men not to authority but to service. The strong to bear the infirmities of the weak. Power, position, talent, education placed in their possessor under the greatest obligation to serve his fellows. Whatever power, ability a person might have is given to serve. All right, preserving the unity. As someone's going to read for me in a moment, uh, Titus. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What is one of the most sure ways to preserve unity? I just gave you the answer in that verse. Rightly dividing the word of truth. God wants us to be united in truth. The truth will set you free. You know, the Bible actually says, I know it sounds like kind of cookie-cutter theology, but Paul says, be sure you speak the same thing. God wants us to have a united message. Is that right? Now, does that mean that we should never have any freedom to think differently about anything? No. And, you know, within our church, there's some diversity of thought on some, you know, you ask 10 pastors what they think about Daniel 11, you might get 11 answers. Uh, you ask, you know, about 144,000 or some of these difficult chapters you might find in Zechariah 14 or in Ezekiel 
People I respect might have a little different slant because you know, some things are a little foggier than others. But there are foundational truths that we should be united on. And if we're united on those truths, there will be unity. Uh, you see what I'm saying? They're the ones that you know, are really going to make a difference from day to day in how we live and operate. If someone here says, well, I think the Sabbath should be Sunday, and someone says, I think it should be Saturday, is that right away going to cause a problem? Yeah, we're not going to be meeting together, are we? <laughs> so, I mean, we've got we to be agreed on some basics or you're going to have all kinds of chaos. Please read for us. Titus chapter 1, verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. So there should be the elders, Titus is being told, should have some leadership to be able to teach sound, solid doctrine. There should be exhortation that takes place. I'm going to read 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. Preach the word, be ready in season, out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort. Now, what's encompassed in the word rebuke? That would talk about a, a parent maybe telling their child you're not supposed to shoplift. <laughs> um, you're, you're admonishing them. You're telling them that's not the right behavior. You're confronting them. That's what's encompassed in the word rebuke. Is there some authority connected with being able to rebuke? Yeah. Should parents be rebuked by their children? <laughs> Sometimes we are, but uh, I think that, that would be a little disrespectful. And so he said, you know, um, Exhort, now how do you do it? With a long suffering and teaching, be patient, for the time is coming when they're not going to endure sound doctrine. They get teachers that tell them what their ears are itching to hear. But he's saying we should preserve the unity by clear biblical teaching. We make a big emphasis on that here at Granite Bay. Church discipline, now this is a difficult section. Um, because you do have an organization, at some point you need to make tough decisions and there needs to be discipline. There needs to be accountability. Jesus said in Matthew 18, if there's a brother, after you talk to him personally and then you take with him two or three, um, Matthew 18, verse 16, you take one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word might be established. If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to hear them, you have a church business meeting, let him to be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. He is out there in the world. He's no more part of your organization. They would call that being disfellowshipped. Um, we know there was authority. Acts 15, 6. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider a matter. When they had a difficult subject, they'd bring together the leadership. They would debate what the issues were. They'd come to some resolution. They always did it in a servant leader spirit. And you can read, uh, here's a difficult verse, in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7, background, um, or 1 Corinthians 5, verse 4 through 7, a young man in the church was having an affair with his stepmother, and the church was just laughing about it. They weren't doing anything about it, and Paul was outraged, and he said, you've got to deal with that person. He said, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit might be saved in the Lord. That means put him out of the church. If he's going to go live according to the flesh, but hopefully he'll come to his senses and be saved. If you let him continue in the church thinking this is okay, you can destroy him. You put him out of the church. It's the redemptive thing to do. There's some consequences. He will hopefully say, you know, what, what have I done? He'll repent and he can be saved. He says, your glorying is not good. Do you not know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven. He's saying, purge this out of you because it's like having an Achan in the camp. God cannot bless when the church knowingly ignores outright and open apostasy in its ranks. It's kind of like you're endorsing it. So he said, you have to have church discipline. I mean, what does it do when a person says, hey, Praise the Lord, I just got baptized. I'm a member of the Granite Bay Church and they're telling their friends in the bar and they got a cigar in one hand, a drink in the other and they're listening to worldly music. Oh, so that's what they believe over there. And, and if a church never takes any kind of stand on things like that, what does it do to your witness in the community? You have to, there has to be standards. Now you work with a person, 
you're patient, you're redemptive, but at some point you've got to say, look, brother, sister, you either believe or you don't. And uh, it, the Bible very clearly uh, tells us that. Titus 3, 10 and 11, reject the device of man after the first and the second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-centered. Give them some opportunities, but eventually you need to deal with it. And then finally, and I talked about this, organizing for mission. It's so important that we get organized. When they sent out the apostles, Jesus sent them out two by two. He gave them clear instructions about how to go, where to stay, what to take. Um, the apostles, when they prayed, as they sent out Paul and Barnabas or Silas and Paul, um, there was an organization. They had a mission, marching orders. Jesus in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, Mark 16, he tells us what our mission is. And we are to be organized and trained for that mission. And so it's through being organized that uh, God is able to accomplish that. So, but it, we want to be a spirit-led organization. If the church gets to the place where we think if we only had more money, we could do more good, well, money's helpful. Or if we think if we had better machines, better equipment, better buildings, most cases, you know what the Lord is waiting for? Better men and women. And there's no limit to what he can do if he's got better men and women for the mission. Amen? Well, I think we've run out of time for today. Next week is going to be our last lesson this quarterly. I want to remind you, before I go off the air, we do have a gift book. I've got Barry here somewhere. Ooh, you'll enjoy this. The church is at Babylon. <laughs> the church is at Babylon. You want me to answer that? Ah, oh, you got to get the book. <laughs> Ask for offer number 712 when you call. If you call the phone number, it's 866-788-3966. And you can download this also for free right now and read it. Just text SH116. You text SH116 to 40544 and you can download this, read it. And if you order a hard copy, read it and share it with a friend. God bless you, friends. Uh, Lord willing, we'll study his word together again next week. Did you know Amazing Facts has a free Bible school that you can do from the comfort of your own home? It includes 27 beautifully illustrated study lessons to aid in your study of God's Word. Sign up today for this free Bible study course by calling 1-844-215-7000. That's 1-844-215-7000. Amazing Facts change lives. My life was in turmoil. My wife and I were fighting all the time. I got away from everything and everybody. I don't know, it just, I always had this emptiness in my heart. I don't want it filled. I just felt like I went my whole life, you know, just searching for something. And My father died and that ruined me a lot. My father didn't believe in suicide. And I didn't want to live, but rather than disrespect him, I decided I would just become so mean that someone else would do it to me and I wouldn't have to. So I joined the Army thinking, what better place to get killed than in the Army? Now while I was in the Army, my daughter got injured. She uh, was in an accident and she was blind and paraplegic. And it's just like I felt the whole world was coming down on me. And one morning I just really got mad and I gave God a cussing like you wouldn't believe. I said, I'm not Moses, I'm not Abraham, you know, I don't, but I put my sandals on just like they do, and I'm a man. I don't want to know why this is happening to me, I just want to know that it's happening for a reason. If you tell me right now that this is all for a reason, then you can stack it on me from here to the end of time, and I will never complain again. And that little TV came on, it had been sitting there just static all night long. And there's this minister when he pops up and he says, today's lesson's from the book of Job. God only lets those suffer that he loves the most. And I said, well, that's all you have to say, Lord. I appreciate it, baby. From that day forward, I knew that he was there and he was in my life and that he would help me. I went to prison just almost immediately after that. I was in prison for aggravated assault. I was in one of the worst prisons in the state of Tennessee. It was full of gang activity. I got my throat cut, 52 stitches in my neck. I could take those fingers and stick them all the way throughout my mouth. 
I'd gone to the library that day because it was really about the only thing to do. But I ran across this little book called The Richest Cave Man. This book is hilarious, but it is great. I'm sitting there with this big beard, and I'm thinking, hey, I know what it's like to look like a caveman, but <laughs> I'm not an educated person, I guess you'd say, but I'm a simple guy. I'm just really a simple guy. And that's what I loved about Doug Batchelor, because this guy is just as straight out as you can get. And my wife and I, we've kept contact through all these years, and so much has gone on. And I told her, I said, listen, now, this is the center of my world right now. And I said, I really want you to be involved in it with me. I need it. And I said, you will too if you ever just take hold of it. I told my wife, I said, listen, they've got this amazing facts Bible study going here. And this is the best way for you to get this information, and I think. I said, because it's broken down and they give you questions and to, to make you look for these things, you know, so it's not anyone telling you, you find it on your own. And they teach you to actually use the Bible. She was there faithfully every Wednesday until we decided, you know, she wanted to be baptized also. She saw it coming around. Uh, the choice was made. And October the 4th, 2014, my wife and I were baptized in the water at the same time. And we started our walk together, I guess you'd say. I went through everything that a man could possibly go through, I guess. From marital trouble, loss of family members, death in my family. My children were harmed and my daughter was handicapped for life. I went to prison, but still, I kept my word to God that he could stack it on me as much as he wanted. And I'd never questioned him again, and I didn't. But I can say this much, he never put nothing on me that I couldn't handle. And he walked with me through it all. And I'd like to say that to anyone who is in prison, not to give up, don't lose hope. Put your faith in the Lord and study and seek him and he will seek you. And my name is Charlie Green and I want you to know that you and Amazing Facts have changed my life.